Well, welcome everybody. Um, you are in the CLE from the University of Minnesota Law School. It's complicated, Facebook's liability for user posts. My name is Jim Parodic. I'm of the class of 98 at Minnesota Law School. Uh, I am on the board of advisors and uh, I'm co-chair of the Academic Engagement Committee. Um, this is the first of several uh, virtual events this week for the Spring Alumni Week. This is kind of the launch event. Um, this will be ahead of the in-person reunion events this coming weekend. And I'll give you some more information on those events at the end of the hour. Just a couple of introductory notes about the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and the link to the recording will be shared via email following the event. We have live auto caption enabled, uh, auto captioning enabled. Please click on the live transcript feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to view or hide the, these captions throughout today's discussion. We will reserve time at the end to address questions submitted via the Q&A feature also found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So feel free to ask questions through that. Um, well, it's my great honor to introduce the host of this event, our own University of Minnesota law professor, Bill McGovern. Many of you know Bill, I'll call him Bill, Professor McGovern, Dean McGovern, and the wonderful job he does for the law school as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs for a number of years, including through the pandemic, just amazing work he's done. He is also, uh, he's also a, a, a great plant, Moody Moody and Bennett Professor of Law. Uh, and the topic today is right in the middle of, of his expertise. His scholarship focuses on legal and other rules governing digital identity and privacy, ranging from social media to online impersonation to data security. Uh, Bill is the author of a case book, the sole author, Privacy and Data Protection Law that's taught throughout the country in law schools. And he regularly teaches a data privacy course at the Minnesota uh, Law School. Uh, I would also note Bill brings deep practical experience to his academic work and teaching. Uh, before he became a law professor, he worked as an intellectual property litigator as Foley Hogue, at Foley Hogue in Boston and as a senior legislative aide for then representative Chuck Schumer in DC. So he brings a lot of different perspectives to this. Um, he is also a great follow on Twitter. Uh, that's at Bill McGev. And um, I'll hand it over to you, Bill. Thank you, Jim, uh, for that introduction. And I'm, uh, I'm not the prime attraction here. The prime attraction is our, our two um, distinguished guests who I'll um, welcome in a moment. I think we're going to have an eye-opening conversation. Um, so I'll introduce each of you, uh, and, um, and then we'll be off to the races, okay? Uh, Danielle Citron is the Jefferson Scholars Foundation Schenck Distinguished Professor in Law and Cadeau and Chapman Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. I will never complain about the length of my professor title ever again. She is one of the foremost privacy law scholars in the U.S. Uh, Danielle was named a 2019 MacArthur Fellow that's what they colloquially call, colloquially call the Genius Award in the press, for her groundbreaking work on cyber stalking and intimate privacy, among other topics. And that's work she's done as a scholar, as a public intellectual, as a policy advisor, and as an activist. Um, our other guest is Jeff Kossoff. Jeff is an associate professor of cybersecurity law at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis. So we're talking about section 230 today, as I'll mention in a moment, Jeff wrote the seminal book on Section 230 a couple of years ago. It's entitled The 26 Words That Created the Internet. Um, he received a 2019 Andrew Carnegie Fellowship uh, in connection with that work and, and with his new book. Uh, and he frequently um, writes, speaks, testifies in Congress, um, takes invitations from all over the place to try his best to clarify a deeply and widely misunderstood aspect of of internet law and more broadly about regulation of online speech. He also has an informative and hilarious Twitter feed on these same topics and he's at Jay Kossef. Um, he's also the author of the first comprehensive textbook on US cybersecurity law. And before his academic career, he too has the practical experience of having practiced cybersecurity and privacy law and being a journalist for the Oregonian where he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. 
And because I know one of my jobs is to promote our guests' excellent work, uh, I'm going to uh, put, put up a slide um, with their books, just like Jimmy Fallon holding up a copy of someone's book or record when they appear on the show. Danielle and Jeff are both incredibly prolific, but um, we um, want to spotlight um, uh, both a, a, a past book and a current book by each of them. Um, an important book from the past, Danielle's, is um, uh, uh, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace. And I mentioned already Jeff's uh, 26 Words That Created the Internet. And they each have a 2022 title. Uh, Danielle's is available for pre-order, The Fight for Privacy, Protecting, Digity, bleh, Protecting Dignity, Identity, and Love in the Digital Age. I love that title. Uh, Jeff's is already available at a bookstore near you, The United States of Anonymous, How the First Amendment Shaped Online Speech. So I want to thank you both for taking the time to be here with us today. I can't wait to get to our conversation. I'll just take a moment to set the table. Uh, with a new slide. Jeff was not joking when he suggested in his book title that these 26 words may have quote unquote created the internet, um, depending on what you mean by created an internet, at least in some ways. Um, these are the 26 words that are the content of 47 United States Code 230, which is usually known as Section 230. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Phew. So that's not very self-explanatory, but luckily we have our experts with us. How I ordinarily explain this to my students is to say that uh, under defamation law, especially but other aspects of law previously, uh, your responsibility as an intermediary was an all or nothing proposition. You were either a publisher like the New York Times and therefore legally responsible for everything that appeared in your pages, or you were a mere conduit, like the example I normally use is the telephone company that provides the lines for us to talk to each other, but bears no responsibility for whatever we might say to each other. So um, one of the most famous libel cases of all times uh, the is New York Times versus Sullivan, where the Supreme Court came up with the actual malice standard for public um, matters of public concern and defamation. That was actually uh, uh, came uh, emer the case emerged out of an advertisement placed in the New York Times, but yet the Times was legally responsible for whatever defamatory content there might be there. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, it's based on the notion that the New York Times is reviewing and uh, vetting and approving everything that appears, all, all the news that they have decided is fit to print uh, in their pages. Um, whereas the phone company plugs the wires in and then lets us do the talking. Um, that was before intermediaries like Facebook and Twitter, like platforms for recommendations like Yelp or Angie's List. Uh, video sites like YouTube and TikTok. Um, and all of these have substantial amounts of user generated content that doesn't necessarily fit into either category very neatly. And that's something that both of our guests today have given a lot of thought to. Um, so that's my introduction about what Section 230 is. It says that of those two choices that Congress had in view at the time, publisher or not publisher, when it's user generated content, these platforms are not liable. They're not publishers. They're only publishers if they themselves function as the quote information content provider, which is to say they're the ones doing the talking. Um, so I want to talk to Jeff first, um, because your book goes through so much of the kind of history of the development of this statute. So what made Congress at the time that they did this in the 1990s, worried about this situation and, and, and feeling like they had to make a federal law to, to say which of these binary choices um, applied to online platforms. Sure, well, uh, first, thanks for having me. And uh, I have to give the disclaimer, everything I say is only on my behalf, not on behalf of the US military, should be self-explanatory. Uh, but uh, yeah, so in terms of what motivated Congress to do this, I would step back to your description and say there was kind of like a subcategory of, um, in addition to the conduit and publishers, there was something that emerged in the common law called a distributor. 
-hmm. which uh, was like booksellers and newsstands. And they were liable if they knew or had reason to know of the defamatory or in some criminal cases obscene content. And uh, it was a fairly easy standard for the courts to apply to bookstores because they would say, did the bookstore owner see this defamatory content or was there any reason to think that they were selling defamatory content? If not, they don't face liability. Uh, it got trickier to apply to the early online services that my students, when I talk about now, they just give me blank looks like, what, what are you talking about? Which are CompuServe and Prodigy because they were not born at the time. And um, they had very different business models or really moderation models in that CompuServe did very little moderation. They basically had these online forums People could post what they wanted, and uh, they, they didn't really review anything. They had very few policies. While Prodigy wanted to be very family friendly and be a place that parents would be okay having their kids go on to, so they had a lot of moderation. Not surprisingly, they both get sued for defamation uh, based on third party content that's posted in the early 1990s. Uh, CompuServe gets the case dismissed because the court says CompuServe is just like a newsstand. And, and there was some unfortunate language, but the court said, you know, you, do, you uh, don't have any editorial control, which wasn't exactly true because CompuServe still could kick people off if they wanted, and they did do that. But that was the judge's distillation of it. Then a few years later, Prodigy tries to make the same defense. And they say, we want to be classified as a distributor for this defamation lawsuit. And a state court judge on Long Island says, no, I'm going to hold you to be a publisher because you are different than CompuServe. You actually exercise editorial control. Mm -hmm. So you're more like a newspaper than a newsstand. So this is 1995, right as Congress is overhauling the telecom laws for the first time in 60 years. And what Congress sees is, you know, there's now this huge disincentive to moderate content. And there was a lot of concern about this new thing called the internet and that children would be able to access pornography on it. And Congress said, you know, we, we want to both promote this new industry, but we also more importantly, want to give the platforms the flexibility both to moderate content and also give tools to people like NetNanny and SurfWatch and those sorts of things. And so by giving those 26 words, what that says is, uh, regardless of what you do, you could moderate or not moderate, you won't, an online service will not be treated as the publisher of third party content. So that's a fairly high level overview of sort of what Congress was thinking at the time. Right. So the idea was, if um, moderating turns you into a publisher or a distributor, someone who might have higher liability, then you might create disincentives you might encourage platforms to put their head in the mm -hmm. sand and not do any kind of supervision of what um what was going on in their platforms and, and of course if you're worried about kids getting inappropriate content and so forth that that's not a good outcome mm -hmm. um so instead we have the outcome that we have which is the internet we have today uh danielle obviously having um no legal responsibility for user generated content has led to some concerns about things that happen. We'll also talk about some of the ways it's been good for the development of the internet, but your, your, uh, your book, Hate Crimes in Cyberspace, and a lot of your other work has focused on the, the problems that arise. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about ways in which um, this uh, immunity in Section 230 um, has maybe created some some social problems that make you concerned. Unmuting. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to say when Jim was talking about Bill's um, attributes, I was smiling really wide because you're amazing, Bill. And I know your community knows that. Um, but as a colleague in the privacy community, um, my admiration for you knows no bounds. So I Anytime you ask, well, Bill knows this about me, we all say yes to you, right? It's a joy to be here. Um, so thank you for including us. It's always fun to be with Jeff. And the one thing I would add, and this I think is a, is a prelude to answering your question, Bill, which is it's worth noting that the title of, of Section 230C, which we focused on, of course, the 26 words, right, C1, the title of 26, 230C is Good Samaritan, 
filtering and blocking of offensive content. I make it look one word slightly wrong, but the idea of the Good Samaritan is embedded in the title, which I realize doesn't have a lot of statutory, a lot of heft when it comes to statutory interpretation, but nonetheless, like is the signal that Cox and Wyden were saying, we want you to be Good Samaritans, right? We want you to be responsible because we know that federal agencies can't do it all, right? They can't deal with federal cyber stalking and harassment included in the purpose part of the statute. So recognition that we have serious problems, right? Social problems that are often criminal, um, that we need the help of, of companies. Um, we want them to act as good Samaritans. Now, so as Jeff said so well, right? The way in which it's been interpreted in the courts, those 26 words is uh, it, by my lights an overbroad um, it, with an emphasis on free speech without regard to the other purposes articulated in the statute and certainly without regard to the notion of the Good Samaritan, right? And so to get to the problems, I'll just say that one statistic, which I think will horrify, I think, our audience is that there are more than 9,500 sites whose business model is the peddling of hidden cameras, non-consensual pornography, deep fake sex videos, and other non-consensual use and posting of people's intimate images, mostly women, and mostly gender and sexual minorities. So there are sites that are devoted just to gay, trans, bi men. Um, you know what I'm saying? So it's not like it's just women, but, but these sites are, their business model is collecting the data, selling the data, monetizing the data. Some are subscription services, but they really make money from advertising, right? And they can't be sued. So your your nude photo is, you know, let's say you share it with an intimate uh, uh, someone close to you, which just happens about fifty percent of the time, and that person betrays your trust. Posts it on one of these sites, and so often these sites have like it's by geography, so and they include victims' names and their Facebook handles, Twitter, you know, wherever you can reach them. Um, and you go to the site and you say, "That's my nude photo." Right. Either I took it or someone took it of me, but I want you to take it down. Now, what's interesting is the copyright law is exempt from Section 230, but these sites, they don't care. Right. They know that victims have no money and can't sue them and they can't be sued for civil law claims. Right. For, so tort, public disclosure of private fact. So so these sites, their business model is being subsidized by Section 230. They're externalizing a tremendous amount of harm. Mm -hmm. And victims can't go to perpetrators to sue them, not because it's not possible, right? They may be able to track down the perpetrator, but so often they have no money. And so there aren't as many, you know, we have a few lawyers who's, who are incredible, right? Who devote their careers, like Carrie Goldberg. We were just on a, Jeff and Carrie just appeared in my class to talk about Jeff's new book. Um, so there are a few lawyers, right, who take on these cases, either pro bono or low cost basis but they're not enough of them, right? I can count on my hand the number of people. And so you have victims for whom the tort system doesn't work at all. The parties in the best position to minimize the harm are immune from responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. And so we endure a lot of negative externalities, right? There, we endure a lot of harm, right? It falls on victims' shoulders. And so often the criminal law is like, it's a misdemeanor, we don't wanna deal with it. And, and all the incentives are to continue the posting and hosting and mining of the data. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem on my hands. Hence, I, I have been um, batting on for at least 12 years about a reasonable steps approach or having a duty of care, which at the time, like, well, I won't, I don't want to jump ahead of your queue, like where, Bill, you want to take us. But I'll just say that when, Bill, I presented cyber civil rights to the first Privacy Law Scholars Conference in 2000 and nine or eight, no, 2008. Mm -hmm. And I proposed this idea of duty of care. Michael Frumkin came up to me and told me that I wanted to jail communists, that I was the enemy of the first amendment and that I would personally break the internet. And I was like, oh, I'm not tenured yet. <laughs> what have I done? But you know, I stuck with it. So, um, uh, so I will stop. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully I've given you a sense, right, of the yeah. harm that section 230 so enables that the enablers of crime right have no responsibilities all right or very few you know like federal criminal law there's no claim against them 
um, right. right intellectual property you know what i'm saying there there are a few yeah. ECBA, sure yeah. but but not, they're not, they're right. not invoked right yeah. it's, it's not part of the 26 words there are a few exceptions to this liability and one actually recently got added but they're narrow yes. um the biggest one well jeff you'll tell me but i think the the, the biggest one broadest one probably is the intellectual property exception yeah. so uh, YouTube and all those sites have a totally different structure under the Digital Money and Copyright Act for dealing with IP infringement, different from, so user user IP violations are handled in this one way, but all the other potential US user violations are handled in this other way. So Jeff, and I don't want this to be a debate because both Danielle and Jeff have very nuanced views about this, but let's just make sure we have all of the perspectives out of the table first. Um, you know, to hear Danielle tell that part of the story, it sounds like this is a complete flop, right? I mean, we have these cyber cesspools, as Danielle calls it in her calls them in her work. We have um, a law that was focused on incentives that ended up creating some incentives to do some pretty bad stuff. Um, but this law has lots and lots of ardent defenders as well. What's their perspective in terms of the reasons that this is important? The reasons that did quote unquote create the internet. Yeah, so, and, and I'm glad that Danielle talked about sort of the, the sites that I think are really the most abusive of Section 230. I, I think too much of the discussion in sort of the popular press is about, frankly, Facebook. And uh, Facebook, at least in DC, you can't go anywhere without hearing ads about how they want to reform Section 230. And I don't think that that's a mistake. I think that they, for a company the size of Facebook, I think that whatever reforms are made, they're going to survive. They might change things a little. Uh, but I think really where the impact is for 230 is on the other sides of the spectrum that aren't sort of the huge companies, including the really bad actor sites, as well as the sites that want to be the next Facebook or the next Twitter or the next Google. Uh, because I mean, when face the reason why I say the 26 words that created the internet, and I got a lot of flack from a lot of computer scientists and engineers for that title, uh, because they they say no, it was DARPA. Like, I know it was DARPA, but uh, the 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 point is that the internet, I thought it was Al Gore. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's that's the intro to my book. Uh, but 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 yeah, I mean, I I think that the Facebook that was starting out that Mark Zuckerberg started out uh, when he was dropping out of Harvard, that is what required Section 230. And so there, so I mean, e even some of the mid-sized platforms, the, a good example would be Yelp, uh, which I think has some flaws, but overall I think provides a really significant public service. And Yelp, uh, they take a position where they have a content moderation policy where they will, um, they, where they will uh, say, you know, if something has personal information or is threatening, they'll take it down, but they make it very clear that they don't adjudicate factual disputes. So if a mechanic rips me off and I go on Yelp and give a one star review and give the story about the mechanic ripping me off and then the mechanic complains to Yelp, uh, Yelp is almost certainly not going to take it down. Mm -hmm. And um, the and, and that may be good or bad, because I also could be a competitor who's making it up. So there's sort of nuances to this. Uh, but you think about what would happen in a 230 free world, uh, which is kind of how consumer review sites operate in Europe, which is they have to at least, if they get a complaint, depending on which review site, they'll at least temporarily take down the review to investigate it. Um, and if I'm Yelp, uh, my business model is going to have to change pretty drastically because I'm going to face the decision about, well, do I take down the content, the review, or uh, do I defend, potentially defend a defamation case on the merits because now I'm on notice, even if I'm considered a distributor, I know of it. Um, and, and so, I mean, the, the, there are trade-offs like that. I think Glassdoor is another one. Uh, Glassdoor gets subpoenas and lawsuits constantly uh, from employers who don't like that their employees are posting negative things about them. And so Glassdoor would be harmed pretty substantially. Mm -hmm. at, at the same time, I, I share all the concerns that Danielle raised and her, her writing really influenced particularly the proposals that I have in my new book where I look at you know anonymous posts, particularly on slander sites. 
and I look at ways to uh, to to basically it, it, it's a di different approach than what Danielle suggests, but it's um, to basically I, I think that there have been some courts, including the California Supreme Court, who have misinterpreted Section 230 and said that if there's an adjudication on the merits that material is defamatory or otherwise illegal, that that and there's a collateral order saying to take to the platform to take down the content that 230 should not block that. I, I think that's wrong. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's, I don't think that's what section 230 was intended for. And Chris Cox, who's run up one of the authors agrees with that. So I think that's a pretty easy fix uh, that, that I think, I, I don't think it would be a panacea by any means, but mm -hmm. I think it would at least be a step in the right direction. So uh, we're going we're gonna to talk more about reform too, as we, as we go along here, um, because there are lots of different proposals of ways to fine tune section 230 right there are people who say it should just be repealed um president trump is a famous advocate of that and even had a hashtag on it for a while um there are people who say touching it in any way whatsoever will break the internet sort of the the kind of kind of a strong position that danielle described receiving but a lot of people and the smart people and both of you recognize that that maybe some adjustment, but not either total preservation or wholesale repeal is the, is the right way to go. Um, and I, I do want to talk in a minute about those kinds of, of suggested fixes. But first, I want to pick up, Jeff, on something that you were talking about and that one of our guests is asking about. Um, you mentioned Yelp and Glassdoor as sites that you think uh, do a, a good job of sort of voluntarily choosing to do responsible content moderation, um, even though the law because of section 230 doesn't require them to do so. Um, who else? And can you talk a little bit about what the downsides for that are? You mentioned sort of scale of company, but what are some of the reasons why content moderation is, is not a, a magic wand to, to resolve the problems that people identified? So who else, who else does a good job of it and what are the, obstacles to doing it is that for danielle you uh, 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 let's go to you first jeff uh yeah so i mean i i think that the it, it's hard to say who's doing a good job because it, it, it's and, and this is actually what i come back to a lot in my 230 reform discussions i'll talk with any congressional staffer or any member who wants to meet with me and i talk with a lot of them and it's probably a bit 50 50 split on parties that I speak with. And I will say the visions for the internet are radically different. I think mm -hmm. Danielle and I probably to different degrees share the same concerns about the har harmful content that's online. But I will say there's a lot of people, including like half of Congress that thinks the platforms are too aggressive in their moderation. And so that, so, so I, it, it's, hard, it's hard to measure because I think 50% of the people are gonna disagree with most of what I think is good. Uh, but but I think in, I, I think frankly Twitter has uh, ha, and Facebook have improved dramatically in the past five years in terms of particularly explaining what they do. I think they could still do a much better job. Um, and, and there's a lot there's a lot of moderation. I mean, for Twitter, for example, I think it's now like seven or eight thousand tweets per second. So you're dealing with such scale that you're going to have a mix of. Uh, human content moderation, uh, AI, and so you're never going to make the right call on everything. There's some really easy stuff that, like, mm -hmm. obvious that, that not many people are going to object to. But when it comes to hate speech and things like that, things that I think should be taken down, there also are a lot of people who think it shouldn't. Uh, I'd also give um, Pinterest a shout out. I think they they actually do a very thoughtful job. If there are site people or groups that are particularly harmed. Pinterest has a team that actually goes to advocacy groups and says, you know, what are keywords that could uh, trigger things? And, and uh, I, I think that's really informed what they do. And I think that's a really responsible use of the leeway that 230 gives. So Danielle, you actually work with companies advising them around some of the ways that they can do more responsible content moderation uh, to help some of the, the victims that, that you interact with. What are what are the challenges that they face when they try and, and thread this needle that Jeff just described? 
So it's it's certainly true that um, so I've been working with Facebook since I guess 2009 and Twitter since 2000. No, it's the flip. 2009 is Twitter, and then 2011, Facebook. Um, and I'm on Facebook's uh, what they call the Non-Consensual Intimate Imagery Task Force. Uh, and Twitter's Trust and Safety Council and, and work with Spotify, um, Bumble, um, a, among other companies, you know, figuring being a connected critic, but being an, in, an as an insider, you know, you can have influence at scale, which is, you know, frankly exciting and why I've done it. Um, not for pay, but, but have volunteered to do it for over the many years. And what is, of course, interesting is that it's only when it's in their interest, you know, that they actually, that is the C-suite listens to the staff who've been working on safety. So, you know, working with Del Harvey and Sarah Hoyle at Twitter since 2009, or Del was the first, she was like the only safety person. There are only like eight employees, right? And I wrote a memo to her about like, what is cyber stalking and harassment? And she got it and she experienced mm -hmm. it herself. I mean, and it took six years for them to ban threats, right? Why? Gamergate. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's, you, you it's, have to explain Gamergate to people. Okay, sure. It was um, Gamergate was an attack on um, women in the video gaming industry, um, which became like cyber mobs attacking women, threatening um, death threats, you know, posting doxing, posting people's home addresses. Um, it, terrifying. And they often, the mobs often gathered on Twitter. Um, and so it was bad for business. So Twitter was like, maybe we should listen, listen to Dell now. <laughs> you know, like the C-suite was like inviting us in to talk to them, right? Versus, mm -hmm. you know, and especially when Jack Dorsey came on board, I think he was very attuned to harm um, and, and had a really different view. Um, and working with Facebook, they, they, they ban nudity, right? So mm -hmm. we're just helping them in their goal of banning nudity. Our view is we're not anti-porn, we're anti non-consensual use of intimate images. Right. Um, and they've been kind of a leader in the sense of it's in their interest, so they say. So mm -hmm. they um, will take it, images that they've determined is non-consensual intimate imagery, they'll hash it and prevent it from reappearing on Facebook and Instagram. And they also welcome and have, since the pilot in 2017, um, welcome people to send intimate images that have been, they face threats, that they're going to be posted on Facebook, which happens a lot to victims, especially in domestic, you know, like breakups. Right. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it was post Cambridge Analytica that Facebook announced that the pilot was going global. Too few people use it, mm -hmm. right? Why? We don't trust Facebook. So the interesting thing is like, you know, Jeff's two examples of like, who's doing a pretty good job is Facebook's ruining democracy. <laughs> You know, like I'm, I, it's cool. I can say this because no one's paying me anything, right? Like I'm, I'm an outside critic as well. Right. And a lot of that has to do with, and I'm sure Jeff's going to agree with me. The fact that we don't have data privacy laws, this is like, Bill's like, yes, <laughs> he did agreement, you know, writing a leading mm -hmm. case book about it. Right. Uh, advising and working on all these like state and state laws, right. Bill and federal laws. So, so part of the problem, of course, is Facebook is the business model, the, the targeted advertising business model that makes um, um, wanting people to put up content and then being willing to take it down, right? You know, I, Marianne Franks and I proposed to Facebook, this was ages ago, I think around 2015, that they should require written consent for any, you know, seeming nudity, like even of mastectomies. Like, why not just require written consent? Because some nudity is okay by you, right? Mm. And they were like, no. We said, but your policy is no non consensual intimate imagery and no nudity. Why would you say, you know, bottom line is our view was they'd want the data. They'll yeah. take it down, right? Once it's been so adjudicated, but their business model is the gathering of the data and then they'll take down some problematic content. You know what I'm saying? Like when it becomes yeah, a sure. headache for advertising reasons, right. right? And Yelp is frankly, I think it's an extortionate business model, right? If you read Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression, there are a lot of business owners who feel like they have to advertise on Yelp. Otherwise, you know, the prominence, right, uh, on Yelp is, is is questionable. So I always wonder if the FTC is going to go after Yelp, uh -huh. right? One, one can hope, right, in this new era. So it's not that companies aren't doing good. You know, some are doing much better than others, right? As Jeff says, right, uh, they're not all perfect, 
you know, and it's tough to do at scale. And there's some because it's in their interest to try and differentiate themselves on content moderation, right? And in some cases, it's Europe breathing down their neck, right? Like Did you say it's Europe breathing down their neck? It's Europe. Yeah. It's the European Commission requiring right. uh, MOUs to be signed in 2018 that mm -hmm. they take down hate speech in 24 hours, right? And then we have the German law. Um, I feel like now we're going into Jeff's book, the second book, right? Yeah. Right, Jeff? Um, so, so there are a lot of interesting wrinkles, right? But when Jeff, when you're saying you see those Facebook ads that they say, yeah, we need to reform section 230, they talk on both sides of their mouth, right? Because mm -hmm. they were advocating that section 230 be included in the uh, free trade agreement with Canada and Mexico, right? right. They wanted to export Facebook might 230. Totally they fully baloney, right? <laughs> like, yeah, totally. Yeah. Like when, when, I mean, I talk to them a lot about my proposal um, and it's not that staff or like chief safety officer, like Monica Bickert and Antigone Davis aren't open and they listen, they're amazing. They want to talk to me, mm -hmm. but I sort of run like a one man shop in some sense, right? Facebook, it seems to me right. that you've got staff who really care and it just depends if it's in the business interest, if the C-suite's going to say, okay. And I want to add what so so we we've, Sorry, we've that heard was about long. we've heard about that's okay we heard about how it's it was all interesting we heard about how it's um it's contrary to business model of data harvesting and advertising supported content it's, it's also expensive to do it especially if you're going to do it well right you have to if you're going to moderate you have to have moderators and you have to um you know at only bigger companies can afford that a smaller company a startup company might have more difficulty doing it so that's an argument you also hear around mandatory content moderation. I want to pick up on the last point you made and ask Jeff about it because indeed it is in both of the, his, his books. Um, the United States is really exceptional in having a, a, a provision like Section 230. Uh, the situations that Danielle describes would be handled really differently in um, just about every other country in the world in terms of the, um, the platform's legal duties. Um, what's the difference and how much is that the first amendment and how much is it other things i i would say yes <laughs> so <laughs> uh i it, it it's i mean I, the first amendment it is a barrier for a lot of the harms that we have and i mean obviously the first amendment has been interpreted differently there could be doctrinal shifts i don't particularly see that with the supreme court uh, if there's one area where they've been, well, the Fourth Amendment also, but they, they've been fairly expansive uh, over the past few decades on First Amendment issues, um, both for hate speech, I mean, that they've held and they've made it very clear that there's some really vile stuff that is going to be protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and also for misinformation that, I mean, there's not this categorical misinformation exception. I mean, I can't tell you every day someone tells me, you know, why doesn't the FCC just regulate misinformation on the internet? And I think there's a doctrinal reason that, you know, they can't under the First Amendment, but also there's really a normative reason that um, let's look beyond who currently is in charge and just think in your wildest dreams if like there's some president who says that the media are fake news and that they're lying and that they need to be stopped. And I know that can never actually happen, but if there were someone in charge like that, I very, I, I'm very concerned about saying, okay, we're going to have this bureau that says what's misinformation and the platforms can't take it down. So I, I do see it as more of a feature than a bug, uh, but it's also a feature that we need to figure out how to <laughs> Uh, prevent the very substantial harms from happening. But I, I so, so I think a lot of this American exceptionalism does come from the First Amendment. Now, Section 230, I think that there, there are some particularly uh, problematic uses, particularly as what Danielle referred, the types of sites Danielle referred to at the beginning. That That's really where I see the real concerns, the slander sites. If anyone hasn't read Kashmir Hill's reporting in the New York Times about slander sites, that's that's where there's actual to like what Danielle writes about. That's actual Section 230 related problems. Um, misinformation 
that's that's a big problem, but that's also a First Amendment problem. And so I do think we need to differentiate between the two. Sure. And, and, and I mean, Section 230 is easily made a scapegoat for every problem that we see on the internet, including, as you said before, problems at different sides of the political spectrum see differently. And everyone says, if only we didn't have Section 230 or it was totally different, everything would be better. And it's obviously more complicated than that. That said, there isn't either a First Amendment or a Section 230 in a lot of other countries that we would consider, you know, strong democratic nations with traditions of free speech. Um, do, do these global platforms take things down more readily in European other countries as a result of that? Well, so it, it depends on where. I mean, when we're talking about misinformation, I mean, right now there's the DSA that's going through that will have and it's hard to track the, the information has not right. been great about the latest draft. <laughs> so I, it, that's it. That's it. That's that new, the digital services act. That's a new European right. law about yeah. platform responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and that actually might be a worthwhile approach to look at, depending on what it actually says, because uh, so, so I, I'll do the caveat, but it looks like it's more procedural in terms of requiring the largest platforms to sort of give explanations about certain types mm -hmm. of moderation policies. Uh, where, where I would say, I mean, to the, the biggest contrast is, is there's a lot of outside of the, we, I tend to also focus on the EU quite a bit, but over the past few years, there have been a number of authoritarian countries that have passed fake news laws and right. uh, primary, often prompted by COVID, uh, fake news or election fake news, and they have used it to basically obliterate any dissent. Uh, and you have Russia, what they're doing with Ukraine right now. So I feel like that, I mean, when, when we're really dealing with, uh, with like regulating misinformation, I look at the countries that actually are regulating misinformation and I've not seen any, any actual content regulation of misinformation that has been successful. I think there could be transparency. Well, it's successful in the sense that it works, but it's not something you'd like to have in yeah, the US. successful right? for democracy, I think. Yeah. Right, I understand. Yeah. Um, how about things like the non-consensual intimate images that Danielle talks about or slander or um, other kinds of difficult speech? Danielle, are, are, are those taken down more readily in other countries than here because, and section 230 being the difference? Yeah. So. Um... Uh, let's just take Australia and South Korea just and and I work closely with the South Korean um, the digital sex crimes information commission which is new um, they have a serious problem with hidden cameras um, in public bathrooms women's public bathrooms in South Korea and so the change that they've gone through in the last three years has been enormous you know women took to the streets in Seoul in numbers that it each March were more and more. So the first March, my life is not your porn, was 30,000. The second March, two months later, 40,000. The third March, 70,000. And the last March in December, in freezing December in Seoul, 150,000 people took to the streets. So the government responded. Um, and uh, though the law has yet to go into effect, platforms are responsible with a duty of care, kind of similar to my proposal um, with transparency and accountability requirements. And the DC, the Digital Sex Crime Information Commissioner can go to sites in South Korea and say, we've, we've determined this is not consensual intimate imagery. These hidden videos weren't without consent, take them down. And sites in South Korea will take them down. The biggest problem as um, their commissioner explained to me is content posts in the United States, accessible in South Korea, Right. And mm -hmm. often relatives and friends in the United States who are seeing it, um, you know, South Korean residents, they have nothing they can do. You know, the, the mm -hmm. South Korean government and they asked me to connect them with Twitter. And I was like, good luck. You know, like they're they're, you know, um, not going to go out of their way to help and have it um, only vis-a-vis -vis within the country. Right. Like geolocated South Korea. Right. Um, so and the Australian e-safety commissioner, Julie Grant, she's amazing. Um, they have 
relationships with platforms and they, their laws different, right? They have, they don't have a section 230 in Australia. It's more like a notice and takedown sort of regime. And so she gets the stuff taken down, like she and her commission, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she's been, they established this office in 2015, e-safety commission, and she's been the commissioner ever since. They take stuff down again. The problem is America, we're, mm -hmm. we're scofflaws, right? So we externalize a lot of harm, right? And there's nothing these countries can do. And in some respects, that's kind of a, there's some of it, that's a really good thing. That's Jeff's, you know, you read Jeff's United States of Anonymous. I read that, our class read it last week. And this week we're reading David Kay's speech police, um, former UN, uh, you know, commissioner on free speech and expression. I, I love David Kay. He's now a professor at UC, you know, UC Irvine. And so my students having read Jeff and now David Kay, you know, have a real sense of authoritarian regimes and the cry of, of fake news, right? And the piercing right. of political dissent and anonymity. So I do, I'm always quite mindful of being careful what I wish for. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like sure. I, try, I try to be as careful as I can be kind of understanding as you said so well, like what if in a different world, you know, like, right. you know, the we have different governments, you know, like a, it depends on as to whom we're talking about. But I guess in, in my world, my proposal is aimed to address the problem that Jeff raised, which is, what about this, the longer tail? What about these smaller companies, right? Let, so um, let, let, let's actually, let's let's okay. turn to the to the proposals and, and I'll, I'll go to your first, Danielle. So, I mean, we've talked about a lot of the, the difficulties. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, if, um, if striking the kind of balance that you've both identified between free speech and protecting um, users from some of this abusive posting, uh, were easy. If it were easy, we would have probably yeah. solved it already, and you both wouldn't have had to spend the last totally. more than a decade worrying about it. Um, but having done all that work, you've both talked about what steps you would recommend taking in response. Maybe you can e explain to our, our audience, each of you, what you think would be productive steps that can be taken to make this situation better. And I'll, uh, Danielle, I'll let you go first, and then Jeff. So I think we should keep Section 230. And I think we should condition section 230 C1. I think we leave C2 alone. Jeff, that's not in Jeff's 26 words, but it is, right? That's the, you can filter if you do it in good faith, right? Remove. And I think the idea that we filter too much is people just don't like it when these sites remove hate speech because it's hate speech. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're right. pissed, but guess what? That's hate speech. That's speech that demeans, undermines, right? Subordinates, right? Like we took it down because you violated our policies and you don't like that. Well, sorry, right? Um, but I think we should fix section 230 C1, those 26 words, uh, and condition it on reasonable steps to address illegality that causes serious harm. Right, so no provider or user of an interactive service that engages in reasonable content moderation in vis-a-vis um, -vis illegality, which is illegality laws that violates law activity that violates laws of the books, causing serious harm, shall be treated as a publisher or speaker. Right, like the mm -hmm. conditioning and on reasonable steps. And in my book, I explore what do I mean by reasonable steps. And you know, having worked with the professional folks on safety for 12 years, you know, they have their own professional association, um, the, the safety, uh, content moderation and safety sort of world. And there are, so I outline what would constitute reasonable steps, right, for most at each and every, and I've talked a bit in my work about, you know, applying the concept of technological due process to, and I know Jeff agrees with it, right, the notion of transparency and accountability right, explaining what you mean in your terms of service, why you address certain forms of illegality, what you st what your steps are, allowing, uh, you know, people to report, having sort of me methods of, of accountability. Um, but I say reasonable steps and not a checklist that's exhaustive because having worked with Facebook on the, you know, hashing technology, I want companies, um, and of course it's tailored to their size, so what's reasonable for Facebook is different from what's reasonable for a really small, company mm -hmm. engaged in, let's say, you know, a humor site, right? Their sure. business model is not abuse, sure. right? Right. It has a different, you know, duty of care than would be for Facebook, right? With, or Twitter, which Jeff said has billions of posts, billions of tweets, right? Per minute or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I want them to keep them on their toes to just not rest on their laurels and say, okay, checklist, we mm -hmm. have transparency, we have accountability. Now we don't have to do anything, right? Um, but my standard would be writ large rather than like in any given case, 
right? In any given case, they mess up. There's no question about it, right? At scale, this stuff is hard. But if you have the right mechanisms in place and you're motivated to do that, you are motivated to be a good Samaritan, then I think it's worth um, some of that uncertainty that the standard, of course, creates. Okay. Jeff, what, what, what would you do and how does it differ from what Danielle would do? Well, so this is a proposal. So my book came out on 2.30 in early 2019. And mm -hmm. then like suddenly everyone started blaming Section 2.30 for everything that was wrong with the internet. Um, and so, and, and I encountered a lot of what I talked about earlier, like half of the people I spoke with having very different views of what should and could be done than the other half misunderstandings about both technology and operations of platforms and the law. Uh, so what I proposed and every every meeting since mid 2019 with a member of Congress or a staffer, I tell them about my proposal to have like the Cyber Solarium Commission, because my other half of my research is cybersecurity. Uh, there was a Cyber Solarium Commission that was nonpartisan expert that Congress chartered that did a really in-depth investigation of cybersecurity issues and problems and came up with dozens of legislative recommendations based on their findings. And more than 25 of them have been signed into law. Uh, I feel like we have an equal lack of understanding about platforms and content moderation. So every single meeting, I will tell the members and their staffers, I really think that we could have, we, it, we really benefit from something like this that would have investigative powers that could gather a record. Um, and the general response is, that's a nice idea, but for the first is, you know, I can't really write a press release about proposing a commission. And mm -hmm. the second is there's not enough time. But what I'll say is I started asking for this three years ago and we haven't gotten anything done yet. So mm -hmm. if they had just listened to me three years ago, we would at least have a com commission having issued a report. I still wish we could do that because we're so far apart. I can't really stress how, I, I, if there were a third person uh, speaker, I would say I, I would have had suggestions of people who think like Twitter and Facebook should be fully open. And th these aren't just sort of like far out there conspiracy theorists. I mean, there are people who have substantial power who believe that so well, i mean it, 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 i believe that the twitter board is thought to be meeting today about elon yes. musk's takeover attempt and that would be an example of uh, someone who thinks that well i i think yeah and i mean i i actually i mean just to say about that i i don't know he's actually not said a ton about what his specific plans are sure. um i don't think it's terribly useful to just say I'm for free speech. I mean, that's like, I'm for breathing. It's like, yes, of course you're for free speech. But like when you're dealing with like millions of tweets, what what are you going to do when people are like starting a, advocating for a coup in another country or like hate mobbing someone? Or I, I mean, it, it's just so, it, it'll be a nice reason for him. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and I, and I do think, right, that, that part of the problem of this debate and part of the reason that I wanted the two of you is that so much discussion of it in the popular press is is maddeningly unnuanced, right? It's it's as you said, Jeff, blaming Section 230 for everything you don't like about the internet. And then in our polarized country and society, what people don't like about the internet isn't even something that we have a consensus about at all. So I totally take your point. I want to mention that we only have about five minutes left. I have a couple of questions um, that I want to weave in, and then I want to make sure that attendees are posting others if they have them. Um, uh, one person calls back to the discussion we we're having previously about um, business models and 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 no company being sort of perfect, uh, and says Yelp will take down a bad review if the merchant who got the bad review pays Yelp. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it's definitely the kind of concerns Danielle was saying about, um, you know, the mixture of the business model and the um, and the um, content moderation being a complicated interface. The other thing people are wondering about is, um, um, you know, you, you did not name President Trump, Jeff, when you spoke before, but. Um, can you just like give us a one minute explanation and I'll go to Jeff for this of what it, it, I mean, can you explain what President Trump thinks about Section 230 and what his problem is, at least as best as you can? Because it's actually a pretty widespread point of view, uh, especially on the right. 
So continuing to not speak for the US government or the military, I will say that um, I think it's a very, there's a widespread misunderstanding that Section 230 requires platforms to be neutral, uh, that there's a publisher or platform choice, and that Section 230 only applies to neutral platforms. That's not true. That's contrary to the entire purpose of Section 230, but I'll say it's not just among them. I have met a number of journalists, for example, who say, oh yeah, the lawyers for our newspaper have told us forever that we can't moderate comments because we'll lose Section 230. So it, it's, I, and I mean, this is going it's back- Literally to the opposite of what the intent was. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, it's, a, it's widespread, but that's the general, mm -hmm. the general argument. Okay. So in the time we have left, I've, 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 I've taken care of questions. I, I just want to sort of ask each of you to, to say some, um, some parting words, right? So you've talked about the problems. Um, we've talked about the history. You've talked about the reform proposals that you've each advanced around this issue. So what do we see happening next? Do you think that real change is possible in the near future? If so, where will it come from and what will it look like? Um, what what do you hope for in the coming years around uh, platform in, and intermediary immunity, Danielle? Okay, so I'm like with Jeff, I work with a lot of offices, especially on the Senate side. And uh, every time I get, even in the House too, uh, Commerce Committee, every time I get, they're really smart staffers. But Every time I get a call, like, okay, we got a different proposal for you. It's like, they get worse. <laughs> I'm like, but there are a lot of actually interesting proposals from narrow to broad that we could really talk about. And everybody wants to make up their own nonsense. So I, you know, have worked with um, Senator Warner's office on adding some exemptions further with civil rights laws and, 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 and laws, state laws around cyber stalking. And like, I'm not a fan of the piecemeal approach, but if we're going to do anything, you know, CCR, at CCRI, we think, well, you know, we'd be committed to to you know having carvets around the federal and state civil rights laws, um, and work with Spencer Overton on that. Warner's office, really smart staffers, you know, have worked on certain issues with them. But mm -hmm. am I bullish? Mm -mm. You know, like I feel like this is what what Jeff was saying. Like the Republican staffers I talked to think that they've got to fix C2, which is the under, the overfiltering provision. And the Dem staffers want to fix C1, but all with wacky ideas, right? And so I just like, I keep trying. I'm going to keep right. trying. You know, my I'm the little battering ram. Like I'm like a little engine that could, let's talk reasonable steps, you know? <laughs> right. But, but you know, am I bullish? I'm going to leave that one to, to Jeff. Right. And I, and I do want to say CCRI is the um, Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. We didn't actually mention it yet, but um, among Danielle's many um, public advocacy roles is her uh, role as one of many leaders of that organization, which advocates for, for changes of the kind that we're talking about here. Um, so Jeff, um, you spend an inordinate amount of time talking to these uh, staffers on the Capitol Hill and to other policymakers and journalists. What do you think the near future looks like for section 230? Um, so the pessimistic part of me thinks that there's a chance something will just get rolled into some omnibus bill, um, and something that's must pass and that it might have a compromise for both sides that like requires neutral viewpoint neutrality or some nonsense, but also creates carve outs that might conflict with the viewpoint neutrality. Um, because I, I feel like the I, I feel like there's really a lack of interest in really understanding <laughs> what to do, and there's more of an interest in getting news of saying we fixed Section 230, and uh, so that I mean I'm a little pessimistic after three years of this. Uh, I, I'd like to see better discussion, but I I think that it's just going to kind of be whatever can get the majority votes and signed into law. Oh, sorry, thank you both. I, even though you can't give us uh, the sort of optimistic picture that we might have wanted uh, when it comes to federal government, that's sort of par for the courts. Um, thank you both for being here. Um, and I want to go back to Jim now to um, tell us a little bit more about some of the things that are coming up the rest of the week. Thanks, Bill. Uh, 
just an incredibly valuable uh, opportunity to listen to these you experts talk about something that's important to know both as a lawyer and as a citizen. Um, if you liked today, there are two other alumni events that are available uh, virtually coming up on Wednesday, leveling the, the field, practical advice for women mentors and managers on retaining and advancing women in the legal workplace. And that's um, Wednesday at four. You can find, get more information on this and figure out how to enroll in that on the uh, Spring Alumni Weekend website at uh, University of Minnesota Law School site. On uh, Thursday, there's also going to be a roundtable, the impact of the Human Rights Center uh, fel summer uh, fellowship program. That's going to be at noon on Thursday. And again, that'll be on the site. Uh, one other thing, if you happen to have graduated in a, in a year ending in seven or two, this is the uh, time of year in which we're going to ha be having the reunions. And I think they're all next Saturday and they're all in person. Um, I really encourage you to think about going and you can actually go to the website. It's really helpful. You can see who in your class is going. Um, and it'd be great. To, some of those lists are pretty long. Uh, it'd be great to just have everybody kind of come out of this stage of the pandemic and uh, be able to enjoy themselves in person. Um, so thanks again for everybody. And, um, and that's it for me. Take care.